Ah, hello everyone. Uh, good evening and a warm welcome to Manchester Museum here at the University of Manchester. Uh, my name is Esme Ward and I'm director here and it's I'm going to keep going. Um, I want to see so many of you here tonight. Uh, many months ago, I asked the staff here in the museum who they most wanted to give a lecture. Um, and they and I are absolutely delighted you agreed, David, because your name was top of the list. Um, our mission here at the museum is to build understanding between cultures and a more sustainable world. We want to be the most inclusive, imaginative and caring museum you will ever visit. And these values drive everything we do. Put simply, I suppose, we want to be a place where everyone feels they belong. It sounds so simple, doesn't it? But it means opening up to new relationships, people and perspectives, telling truths, new stories, more complex stories, collaborating to become the museum, this city, region and its people might need. Um, since reopening in February, over 600,000 people have visited. And if you told me that we would have had daily queues for weeks after reopening, I would never, ever have believed you. But you see, for the first time ever, and I'm proudest about this more than anything, our museum now reflects the communities and city region we serve. For over half our visitors, it's their first visit here, but more than that, extraordinarily, for over 12% of our visitors, it's the first ever museum visit they've made in their lives. Because, see, if we want a deeper sense of emotional and communal engagement, belonging and ownership for everyone in spaces like this, and we do, we have to create the conditions that enable and encourage that not least by acknowledging and actively addressing our colonial legacy. And it's what we've started to do, what we're trying to do in our new galleries, most notably the Li Kai Hung Chinese Culture Gallery and South Asia Gallery. It's what we're trying to do through our learning programmes, through our curatorial work, like our recent repatriation, and of course, through events like this evening, which we hope will challenge us and move us forwards. So it's with real thanks, I'd now like to hand over to John McAuliffe, Professor of Poetry and Director of Creative Manchester, to introduce this evening's lecture. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and hello also to everybody who's joining us um, on Zoom tonight. Um, I have one other piece of uh, business to tell you before I intro introduce um, David, which is that we have a photographer um, who's taking pictures of everybody here tonight, and if you'd rather not be included in the photographs, please look for one of our colleagues in a Creative Manchester t-shirt and let them know. So first of all, thank you, Esme, for welcoming us to this utterly wonderful museum space and also for making the conditions for this kind of event possible um, here. As Esme mentioned, I direct um, one of the university's um, four research platforms. The research platforms um, are what the university uses to develop interdisciplinary research and networks. And we want them to open up new conversations and new exchanges both within and outside the university in the areas of sustainability, digital futures, health inequalities, and for Creative Manchester, creativity in its broadest um, sense. One of the events I suppose that we're very happy to be involved in is these solstice lectures, which um, happen quarterly at each of the university's four great cultural institutions, here tonight at the museum, but also at Jodrell Bank, at the Whitworth, and at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library downtown. And we've also been delighted over the last couple of years to work with our colleague, Professor David Olashoga, on a number of interdisciplinary projects, including the British Pop Archive, the brilliant campaigning research and activism on joint, and joint enterprise prosecutions, and most pertinent tonight, on the role of public monuments to history. Work which drew on his own research and his work in Bristol as an expert witness at the trial of the Colston Four. 
a case which showed how public monuments and collections not only represent history, but are the means for retelling our history and making new connections. David joined the University of Manchester as a professor of public history in 2019. He is also, of course, a broadcaster and a filmmaker whose main subject areas are empire, race, and slavery. You will all know his work from Black and British, A Forgotten History, from the series Civilizations in 2018, from A House Through Time, and most recently from Union, a series which brought together 21st century popular ideas about union and nation, brand new archival finds from across these islands, and his own careful, resonant narrative about the fault lines that Brexit and other recent events have made central to these islands' contemporary politics again. As well as his TV work, David is an award-winning author. His books include Civilizations, Encounters with the, and the Cult of Progress, The World's War, which was First World War Book of the Year, and The Kaiser's Holocaust, Germany's Forgotten Genocide and the Colonial Roots of Nazism. So David is going to um, talk to us for some time tonight, and at the end of that, there are going to be, um, uh, there's going to be a chance for you to ask questions. So as he's talking, if you uh, have something that you'd like to ask him about, please make a note as you go along, and we'll look for you afterwards. Please join me now in welcoming Professor David Olashoga. television experience and I can't even turn on the mic. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, John. Thank you, all of you, for being here this evening. I think I'm going to try and speak for about 40 minutes, although this is about 2,000 words over that, so I'll be editing and trying to discover self-discipline along the way. Um, it's wonderful to be here. I should probably say it's wonderful to finally be here because we have tried to schedule this lecture on a couple of previous occasions. So it's very, very good to third time lucky be finally on this podium. Um, as Esme said, this museum has undergone a radical physical transformation, the wonderful new galleries of which I've just had a tour. But we're also going to talk tonight and hopefully discuss in the questions uh, the deeper philosophical transformation that museums across the world are engaged in. I wanted to begin, if I may, however, by talking about myself and my own relationship with museums, and the reasons for that will become apparent. Um, I only ever wanted to study history. It was the only thing I cared about at school. And inevitably, that meant that was partly inspired by museums. And as a result, I cared deeply about museums. I've sat on the advisory board of one museum. I'm a current trustee of another. Last year, a series, a television series that I devised that was made by my former television production company helped local museums across the United Kingdom to work with local residents to tell the histories of their streets over the centuries. The point of that series, the reason why I devised that format, was that it was a, a way of using television to do something that everybody I know and everyone I respect in the museum sector already does and is constantly seeking to do, which is to take museums and their collections out to communities, to make museums more active and prominent within the towns and cities in which they sit. Museums, as the whole sector is determined to remind the nation, are, are not just institutions boxed up in their often imposing Victorian facades, but repositories of shared stories. Outreach, engagement, seeking ways to share collections and often thereby better understand them, and seeking partnerships with communities, both here in the UK and critically with communities of origin abroad, are all central to the thinking of many of the museum sector professionals whom I've had the pleasure and the privilege of working with and from whom I've learned so much. Like most people, my passion, my engagement with museums began in childhood. Museums, when I was growing up, are for what, what they mainly remain today, which is places in which families like mine, with little money and resources, could gain access to knowledge and inspiration. While the schools I attended growing up in the Northeast in the 70s and 80s 
were underfunded, underambitious, and underachieving with a fraction of the resources available per pupil in wealthier schools and private schools. Inside a museum, there was some degree of equality. The tradition of museums being free to access, available to local communities, and operating, at least unofficially, as places through which enormous disparities of access to education and educational funding can momentarily be bridged is one that this museum, more than most, strives to maintain. Museums were, for these reasons, one of the few tools that my mother had at her disposal with which she could seek to compensate for the fact that her children were consigned to failings, failing schools by a system that had little to offer and few expectations of working class children, along with libraries, documentaries on television that I adored. Museums and art galleries were fundamental in counterbalancing disadvantage. Anyone who's lived in this city this year may well have borne witness to the breathtaking example of the enduring power of museums that Esme mentioned a moment ago. The ability of museums to capture the mood, engage with communities, and fire the minds, particularly those of the young. The reopening of this museum earlier this year, as Esme said, was just astonishing. It was proof, if proof were needed, that Manchester is one of the great cultural cities of Europe. But more than that, it was testament to the enduring significance of museums. Those images that I followed on Twitter and I saw for myself when I came up to the campus in the first week of opening, stretching around the block, thousands of people flocking to get into this museum were remarkable and powerful. The ways in which and the extent to which Manchester Museum was and is embraced by the people of this city meant that its physical transformation was accompanied by a quite extraordinary reaffirmation of its values and its changing relationship with this city. Anyone who likes to argue that museums are stuffy Victorian institutions that have now somehow passed their sell-by dates saw their arguments profoundly undermined by the opening of this institution in February. And conversely, Anyone who was looking for proof of the ongoing importance of museums in the 21st century needed merely to stand on the streets outside these buildings in, this week, in those weeks. In that very first week, 50,000 people came through these doors. Since then, this museum has done ever more to live up to its desire to remain inclusive and linked to wider communities of Manchester through film nights, late nights, enhanced programs of exhibitions and events like tonight. Museums are not zoos. They undoubtedly do have a future to play in the world, just a different one to that imagined by many of their founders. I'm undoubtedly a beneficiary of the social function of museums. I'm someone who today has passions and interests that have lasted my lifetime that were first ignited by childhood visits to museums. A few weeks ago, I did an event in London with Mary Beard, who told me a story I'd never heard of how her pathway to becoming this country's greatest classicist began when somebody at a museum took something out of a glass case and showed it to her. A curator happened to be passing, saw an interested, a child interested in an object, and went out of their way to make it available to them. Like millions of people, I was brought up to appreciate museums as remarkable engines of learning and also one of our great civic cultural achievements. And my life has been punctuated by moments when I've been stopped in my tracks, astonished at the, my proximity to historic objects and works of art. The signatures of Churchill and Stalin, side by side in a museum in Oxford. In the British Museum, seeing the double-headed serpent, probably a symbol of the Aztec god Quetzalcoatl, an object that might well have been part of the ceremonial dress of Emperor, Emperor Moctezuma of the Aztec people, an object he might have worn at the fatal moment of his fatal encounter between the Aztec Empire and Cortes of the Spanish, the catastrophe that led to the decimation of Mesoamerica. I might have thought a few years ago that those Transformatory moments in museums were maybe a feature of my younger age, and I'm too cynical and wizened to have such moments these days. That thought was demolished three years ago 
in Washington, D.C., at the Museum of African American History and Culture, when I was more moved than I would have thought imagined by the, by the sight of an old 12-string guitar that was owned and played by the great blues musician Lead Belly. There in front of me, in a glass case, was the instrument upon which the music I've listened to my whole life was composed and played. As a child, I adored museums. Now, as a parent, I see it as part of my job to instill a similar passion in my daughter, to be frank, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> However, as someone who is half British and half Nigerian, another aspect of museums was, from a relatively young age, apparent to me. Much of my family lives in London, and that meant that as a child we could afford to spend part of each summer in the capital. And in each one of those visits, we were taken by my mother to the British Museum. And there, in those days, on the grand stairwell to the left of the main entrance, arranged on a huge metal frame, were a small fraction of that museum's collection of the brass ally plaques taken from Benin City by British forces in 1897, the so-called Benin Bronzes. It was in the British Museum, as a citizen of both Britain and Nigeria, that my relationship with museums became more complicated. As it was there that the unquestionable foundational links between museum and empire and of the racial ideas of past centuries began to become apparent to me. The Benin bronzes were the first objects that I encountered in a museum which led me to ask deeper questions, questions about the processes and the events that had led to them being there in the British capital rather than in Nigeria, that led to them being so far beyond the reach of the ancestors of the people who created them, that took them out of the reach of my family members then in Nigeria, that led me to ask how they felt about their continuing absence. And as a Nigerian, am I part of the us or part of the they? I came to ask these questions as a British Nigerian, standing there in the staircase of the British Museum. And I found myself where I still stand, on both sides of the equation, an undoubted beneficiary of the Western Museum tradition and a citizen of a nation whose most significant and valued cultural treasures were violently appropriated and then distributed to such museums. When I was a child, one of the banknotes in Nigeria, on the our currency, the Naira, carried a picture of the mask of Queen Idia. It's an image that's on the cover of one of my books, an image of an object that is regarded as central to Nigeria and its people. Yet, both of the two identical masks of Queen Idia that matter so much to the people of Nigeria cannot be found in Nigeria. One is the property of the British Museum, the other of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. It is now 63 years since independent Nigeria first requested the repatriation of those and other works looted from Benin City in the 1890s. The more I learned about the royal art of Benin, the more I understood the enormity of the fact that they had been torn from the walls of the royal palace and shipped to London. The bronze plaques record the Obas, the kings, and the other royal figures of the Benin kingdom telling the history of a dynasty that stretches back to the 16th century, an extant dynasty that stretches back to when Britain, or England, was ruled by the Tudors. Even Victorian observers, steeped as they were in the biological, pseudoscientific, social Darwinian racial theories that had fully metastasized by the 1890s, even they were able to understand the sophistication of the methods developed to create the Benin Bronzes and that they were, by their very existence, a profound challenge to those racial theories. According to the racism of the 1890s, sub-Saharan Africans are people disconnected from the golden thread of Western civilization, which allegedly stretched unbroken from classical antiquity through the early church, the Renaissance, and the Enlightenment, linking the cultures and the of societies of contemporary Europe to ancient Greece and Rome. Adrift and outside of that tradition, Africans were in the minds of some, not only uncivilized, but a people without history. Yet in 1897, thousands 
a plaque, statues, and other objects gathered in London after the raid on Benin were in themselves evidence of a sophisticated civilization and evidence of the historical record Africans were said to not possess. The brass plaques of the palace walls of Benin had been cast in order to memorialize the reigns and the great military victories of past Obas. They recorded the rituals that punctuated each year and the festivals in which power and grandeur of the Obas was put on public and ceremonial display. They describe the spiritual and religious universe of the Edo people, and even record the arrival of the first Portuguese traders in West Africa half a millennia ago. The Obas are depicted as the physical centers of many plaques, larger than those around them, surrounded by their retinues, the symbols of their gods, the symbols of their own godlike powers. Here were images of an extraordinary civilization. The Beni Bronzes, perhaps inevitably as a Nigerian, were my starting point, and I'd like to come back to them later. But I'd first like to talk about the history of museums, because it was actually that experience of thinking about the Benin Bronzes that led me for the first point as a young man to study the British Empire. The Benin Bronzes were my entry point into the study of Britain and its colonial exploits. But when I was first introduced to the world of museums, I imagined, like most people, that museums are somehow neutral spaces. In particular, what are sometimes called the encyclopedic or global or world museums are presented to us in exactly that way, as spaces in which the collective cultural achievements of humanity are displayed. And through the cultural objects and artworks that punctuate that long story, we can experience the human journey through rational, dispassionate, and neutral storytelling. This is the history of the world in 100 objects approach to museums. And it was Neil McGregor, the author of that work, the former director of the British Museum, who said that the functions of such museums was to show the world to the world. That great sweeping story of humanity and culture, presented by encyclopedic museums, often brilliantly presented, has, however, pushed to the margins another more inconvenient and uncomfortable history, that of how those collections were acquired and the role of museums themselves in the imperial project. The key questions and the key uncomfortable realities have for decades been sidestepped. From whom were they taken? Under what circumstances were they acquired? That often ugly story is one that until recent decades tended to be papered over by museums and continues to be the subject of significant resistance in certain institutions towards these inconvenient truths. For decades, museums, in some cases for centuries, hid behind euphemisms and evasion that were used to muddy the water or complicate the picture of how Western museums acquired their collections. James Cuno, the former director of the Getty Museum, for example, described the British attack on Benin City as an event in which the British, an event that the British openly called at the time a punitive expedition, sometimes describing it as a punishment expedition. Cuno described it merely as one in which the treasures of that kingdom had been, quote, forcibly removed. The violence launched on the surrounding population, the surrounding villages, the deaths of thousands of people who were attacked by a British force armed with Maxim machine guns, fast repeating rifles, even rocket launchers, all of that is concealed behind that gentle euphemism. A euphemism that refuses to make real and tangible the link between those objects and that violence. And the museum sector, like other like parts of the heritage um, sector, over decades developed a whole lexicon of euphemisms, words and phrases that had the effect of concealing or minimizing the violence of the events linked to the objects in their collection. In this way, the viewing, this way of viewing the world, the object came into the possession or was acquired by a museum they passively became part of collections in this verbless, bloodless lexicon of evasion. And museums are not alone. The language of heritage plaques that describe slave traders as West India merchants and slave owners as West India planters are equally opaque and evasive. And other institutions like the 
Constitution of National Biography have deployed language in similar ways. The literature still given to visitors in some grand homes in this country, even today, are similarly designed these and marginalized. Yet silence and evasive language have not held back the tide. Today, an ever-expanding scholarship on the age of empire has created greater public awareness of aspects of Britain and Europe's past that had once been quite successfully rushed to the margins. While similar processes in the former colonies themselves, now of course independent states, in who, and who in many cases have requested the return or repatriation of items and artworks seized during these imperial centuries, have fueled what is now an enormous international debate and discussion about empire, but also about museums, their pasts, and their futures. It was always inevitable that museums would be drawn into that global conversation, that global reassessment and acknowledgement. Dr. Danielle Tom, now curator of the Design Museum, wrote a few years that if, quote, we are actually embroiled in a culture war, even a manufactured one, then museums are battlegrounds because they shape and they reflect cultural contexts. And the reality is that museums were not supplement, supplementary or complementary to the colonial projects of the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries, but fundamental to them. Within glass cases, in museums, lie items that have indelible links to chapters of the imperial past that here in Britain and elsewhere are being dragged out of the historical shadows and into the light, both of scholarship and of greater public understanding. Museums were participants in the age of empire, not just because they became the repositories of literally millions of objects violently taken from communities across the world, but because museums were at times spaces in which the imperial project was intellectually justified and valorized. Museums, along with universities, and perhaps particularly university museums, became institutions in which the study of ethnographic art artifacts and even human ancestral remains was undertaken. Some of those studies sought to develop, advance, substantiate the cultural, biological, racial theories that underpinned later imperial conquests in Africa and Pacific, the Pacific, and that were used to post-rationalize historic conquests in the Americas, Asia, and elsewhere. Among many of those engaged in the expansion of empire and those who benefited from the availability of objects that flowed back to Europe, the notion of colonial loot was regarded as a convenient and justifiable byproduct of the imperial project. The looting and the seizure of cultural and artistic works belonging to colonized people appears within the plots of 19th century novels and was described as an aspect of one of the rewards of manly adventure available to those willing to take up the white man's burden. After particularly successful expeditions and punitive raids that yielded especially significant amounts of loot and booty, it was not unusual for colonial administrations to gather the art and the objects seized by British forces and arrange them into temporary exhibitions before those items were gifted, sold, auctioned to collectors, intermediaries, and sometimes to museums. An official tolerance of the practice of looting, an ancient feature of warfare, came not just from military and colonial officials, but in one instance, from the very heart of the empire. After the sacking and the destruction of the Summer Palace in Beijing during the Second Opium War, a Pekingese dog taken from China by British forces was given as a gift to Queen Victoria. The Queen Empress named the dog Luti. The Queen was so pleased with her stolen dog that she commissioned the artist Frederick Wilhelm Kiel to paint a portrait that depicts Luti sat beside a Chinese vase, perhaps another item looted from China by British forces. Indeed, tellingly, the word loot, which is derived from Hindi, was first used by British soldiers in the India of the late 18th century, the India of the East India Company. But it began to come into more regular usage, it seems, in the 1850s and the 1860s. Out on the colonial frontier, private greed fused 
with the ancient lust for war souvenirs and the long tradition of armies seizing prizes of war. At times, the desire of colonial officials in an empire often ran on the cheap to defray the costs of punitive expeditions through the sale of confiscated loot, fused with an enlightenment desire among collectors, academics, and museums to collect and to classify. The accession details where they exist of thousands of objects in hundred museums across the West detail how they were acquired or gifted from men who had taken di part directly in colonial expeditions. But the ready availability of a market for such items, a market provided by both private collectors and museums, acted as a motivating factor that encouraged soldiers, adventurers, officials and others to engage in practices that in the end helped fill the shelves and swell the storerooms of museums in Europe and North America. And as museums were rightly regarded as civic institutions that confer status upon cities able to establish them, the numbers of museums increased. As the age of empire coincided with an age of unprecedented urbanization and urban growth in Europe and North America, the number of museums grew, as did the demand for new collections and therefore the market for artworks and cultural objects from across the world. And museums were not merely passive beneficiaries of the wars and the raids conducted in the age of empire. Alongside the soldiers, sometimes were geographers, botanists, and archaeologists, men with official or semi-official links to European museums, libraries, and universities, who were at times attached to colonial expeditions. Their function was to use their knowledge to determine which of the cultural and artistic objects that fell into the hands of British colonial forces were of the greatest value and to secure access to them. In some cases, it's not merely collections held by Western museums that are products of the age of European empires. Some museums themselves have imperial origin stories. The Victoria and Albert Museum can trace its origins back to the Museum of the East India Company, the so-called Oriental Repository of Leadenhall Street, the centre of that company's London operations, where today the Lloyds Building stands. And the origins of the British Museum lie in part in the private collection of Hans Sloan. Sloan's links to empire and to slavery, although well-documented and uncontestable, are so uncomfortable to some that they have been both that they have condemned the museum for mentioning them and even attempted to rewrite history and minimize those connections. Three years ago, an exhibition at the British Museum sought to recontextualize a bust of Hans Sloan and to make clear that the vast collection of objects donated by him, a collection that went on to form the nucleus of the museum's early collection, were purchased with private wealth that Sloan had derived from slavery. The museum's bust of Sloan was placed inside a glass case, alongside a contextualization panel, the title of which was Empire and Collector, and other objects that explain more about Sloan and about his life and why he went about inquiring his collection were included. For that simple act of institutional honesty, for merely making an uncontestable historical reality overt and clear and narratively explained, the museum was condemned by some commentators, who also engaged in every possible contrivance to distance Sloan from slavery. They claimed that as the wealth he accumulated from plantations in Jamaica had come to him through marriage, he was merely a tangential, accidental beneficiary. They claimed this despite the fact that Sloan himself, in one of his letters, proudly described himself as a planter, the 18th century term for a slave owner and a plantation owner. Despite the further fact that not only was Hans Sloan a beneficiary of the plantations and the human property he owned through marriage, he was an active investor in the slave trading South Sea Company. And he was a man who could have nursed no illusions about the realities of plantation slavery, having witnessed and recorded its routine violence and murderous exploitation in the Caribbean while working as a doctor in the early part of his career. Those seeking to minimize Sloan's connection to slavery suggested 
that by placing his bust inside a glass case, the museum curators at the British Museum had somehow condemned his memory. If placing objects inside glass cases is now unacceptable and transgressive, museums are in deeper trouble than I had imagined. While I let millions of people strongly believe that museums have a responsibility to recognize their institutional historic links to empire and slavery, their complicity in the long silence about the origins of the collections and objects in their care. It's not difficult to understand why many institutions, both the leadership and the curatorial staff, are nervous about doing so. The hostility, the hysteria directed at the British Museum around the recontextualization of Hans Sloan is not an isolated incident, but it is a troubling sign. Museums can and are made the targets of highly politicized attacks. Museums dependent upon various forms of funding, some of it from the state, have, as you will know, been threatened with the withdrawal or reduction of state support in punishment for seeking to better understand the objects in their care or for daring to acknowledge the historic links to empire or slavery. In a world in which the National Trust the biggest mass membership organization in this country with 5.4 million members, incidentally 31 times the number of members as the Conservative Party. If the National Trust can become the focus of years of highly dishonest attack by politicians, their tabloid or allies, and an opaquely funded pressure group, it's hardly surprising that the leaders and the trustees of smaller museums, reliable often, reliant, I should say, upon their charitable status, are often fearful. One of the features of the dishonest and distortion that characterizes current debates, reportage of those debates around museums, their function, their collections, and in this they have much in common with similarly constructed debates around statues, is that they take place without any recognition that the seizure of objects from conquered territories and colonized people is not newly controversial. It is not only now recognized as exploitative or criminal in the 21st century. In reality, such acts were recognized, at least by some, as controversial and even condemned as criminal at the time. Earlier generations, both the general public and at times even colonial or government officials, were well aware of the great orgy of looting that was taking place in the European Empire. And there were some who refused to condone such actions. To suggest that somehow it is only we in the 21st century who have the empathetic abilities to recognize the injustice of imperial plunder is to issue an insult to our ancestors. Georgian and then Victorian Britons were perfectly capable of recognizing that the plunder, for example, of Bengal by Robert Clive and the East India Company was an appalling abuse of power. It was because of that capacity for people to, to recognize those crimes that Robert Clive was dragged before Parliament and made to defend the extraordinary scale of his crimes and his personal enrichment. Robert Clive's reputation was so tarnished that despite his wealth and his impact on company rule in India, no monuments were put up to him after his death. The statue that stands to him outside the Foreign Office was erected in the early 20th century and for highly political reasons as British officials attempted to rewrite, to massage the early history of India under the company in fear of growing Indian opposition to British rule. Others of the more egregious examples of imperial plunder also found critics in their own time. The British invasions of Ethiopia and Tibet, the war fought against China in the 1860s in the name of opium, by an alliance of European powers and the United States, along with various moments in the long and bloody conquest of India, all yielded large quantities of imperial loot and were all denounced by some at home. The role of museums in this difficult, unpleasant, uncomfortable history is also becoming better known. But the most acutely aware of it are those who work within the museum sector, which in part explains the urgency felt by many in that professional community to recognize this history and engage with communities from which so many millions of objects originated. Current debates 
surrounding museums, return, repatriation, restitution, tend to be dominated by iconic works of art or famous objects. Demands that the British government empower the British Museum to return the Parthenon marbles is a debate many people are familiar with. Just as, just as the question as to where the Kohinoor diamond might reside in the future is high profile enough to draw public attention. These well-known debates over high profile, iconic objects, collections and artworks fit into the template of a news industry which makes them attractive to editors and journalists in an industry better able to report events than processes. And this might explain why so many people have failed to recognise and so many news outlets have failed to properly report that return and restitution is not a culture war talking point or even a theoretic debate but an active and rapidly evolving process that long ago moved from theory to practice and is accelerating, becoming more sophisticated and at an astonishing speed. Cultural, artistic, religious and other items are being returned literally in their millions by museums across the world. In the US, museums have over decades now returned over a million artefacts and around 50,000 ancestral remains to indigenous groups of the United States. Here in the UK, Exeter Museums have, ret have returned the sacred Siskia nations, um, have returned to the sacred Siskia nations, their homelands in Canada, objects taken in the Age of Empire. The Scottish National Museum has returned also to Canada the House of Nishi Memorial Powell, created in the 1860s by the Nsinga people in the Nass Valley of British Columbia, and the list is growing. The active and developing practice of restitution and return is exploding some of the often repeated, often regurgitated myths surrounding museums. The one that has perhaps been most repeated for longest is that restitution and return will leave museums empty. When questioned about the future of the Koh-i-Noor diamond, a diamond that was notably left on the bench during the recent coronation of King Charles, David Cameron justified his refusal to return a jewel obtained under extraordinarily insalubrious circumstances by saying, if you say yes to one, you will suddenly find the British Museum would be empty. That specter of empty museums, full of empty glass cases, might play well in the tabloids, but it is, of course, a fantasy. Most museums, and in particular national encyclopedic museums, like the British Museum or the V&A, have collections so vast that in some cases they've not even been able to properly record or accession objects they required decades ago, as the recent scandals at the British Museum have demonstrated. One of the falsehoods, so one of the reasons falsehoods like that are repeated by men like the former Prime Minister, and the one of the reasons they have an, Im an impact, is that the public are generally aware that the museum's buildings that they visit are figuratively the tips of icebergs, only a fraction of the story. They're unaware that museums have off-site storage facilities. And that these anonymous looking buildings that you could easily mistake as a distribution center, that is where the vast bulk of museums' collections are held. Many people in this room will know the details better than I, but the world's museums and art galleries have, on average, it's been estimated, between 1 and 5% of their collections on display at any one time. It can be higher for art galleries. Tate Britain, for example, exhibits 20% of its permanent collection at any one time. The Louvre cares for a little under half a, uh, half a million artefacts and artworks, and of those, 35,000 are on display at any given time. The National History Museum keeps 95% of its vast specimen collection in storage. The National Maritime Museum has 93% of its paintings and prints in storage, one of the largest artistic collections in this country. There are roughly 80,000 objects on public display at the British Museum at any one time, which represents around 1% of its collection. 99% of the objects from all over the world in the care of the British Museum, covered by the British Museum Act, including some of the Benin bronzes, are not even on display. So the idea that calls for restitution can be brushed aside by claiming that museums will be empty, that is a self-serving, blithe 
myth that collapses under even the most basic analysis. The real challenge faced by museums is not empty shelves, but the struggle to better understand, better catalogue, and better know their collections. And in the 21st century, to comprehensively digitise them, to make them more discoverable. The legacy of the frenetic, at times almost fetishized, over-collecting of the 18th, 19th and 20th century has left a backlog, backlog that digital technology can now begin to address. Empty museums and empty shelves are a culture war chimera, confected not to inform museum politics, policy, but to generate tabloid headlines. The growing global movement for return and restitution takes me back to where I started, back to being a child in front of the Benin bronzes, when I came to realise that there was another story I was not being told, the story that that institution was then unwilling to acknowledge. And while researching my next book, I discovered a closer connection between myself and the art of Benin. In 1892, five years before the raid on Benin City, the seizure and the seizure of the thousands of bomb plaques and ivory treasures from the Kingdom of Benin, a very similar raid was launched against my ancestors. They, the people of the city of Ijebu Ode, to the north of the Nigerian commercial capital of Lagos. They, as the people of Lenin, of Benin were later to do, had refused to submit to British imperial power to the extent that the British colonial authorities demanded. The events of the punitive raid launched against that city and against my ancestors in military and tactical terms is very similar to the raid launched five years later against Benin, and there's a reason for that. In 1897, when the British military colonial authorities were debating how to deploy their overwhelming military power to punish the people and the rulers of Benin, they were deliberating with military material, which weapons they would require to achieve their task, they went back to the records. They went back to the last time British forces had decimated a middle-sized South African kingdom. That search for precedent took them back to the raid on Ijebu Ode, what the British called the Jebu War. It took them back to the attack on my ancestors that became a military template for the raid on Benin. It used to be thought that around 3,000 objects had been taken from Benin City in 1897. That figure was a gross underestimation of the acquisitive lust of those who took part in that expedition. Today, the, the Digital Benin Project has identified 5,240 objects having been sealed by forces in the raid that are today in museums, although many more objects are in private collections. In addition to the official looting, that was intended to defray the costs of the expedition, there was extensive private seizure of artworks. Some of the first objects to be returned to Nigeria have those been owned by the ancestors of soldiers and officials who took part in that military expedition. The archaeologist and anthropologist Dan Hicks has noted that most of us who live here in the United Kingdom are never that many miles away from an object taken from Benin in 1897. I wrote this lecture in my office at home in Bristol, which is three miles from that city's museum that holds two artworks from Benin. We are tonight in another museum that currently holds 23 objects seized from Benin by the British expedition. Not far away from us in Liverpool is a larger collection of 71 Benin artworks in the Liverpool World Museum. However, here again, the process of return and restitution, the cooperation and partnership between institutions holding objects taken in the 1897 raid and communities today in Nigeria and Benin are beginning to develop and bear fruit. The process has begun. The momentum and direction of travel is clear, as are the benefits to all concerned. In the past two years alone, we have seen the return or the declaration of intention to return of objects looted from Benin City by the museums in Newcastle, Aberdeen, Cambridge, and the Horniman Museum in London, as well as those in private collections. And this museum has long since publicly committed itself to working with relative par relevant parties in Nigeria and across the Nigerian diaspora, as well as its peers in museums and communities here in Manchester, to return items looted from the Kingdom of Benin, currently held in this collection. 
Manchester Museum is seeking to do this by bringing in local diaspora community knowledge. And this process is premised on initiating dialogue towards unconditional repatriation. As a university museum, this institution has more leeway than some others and is therefore in a position to lead, a position that Esme and her team are doing their best to use. That stance on items looted from Benin is in keeping with other developments here at Manchester. Developments that are not at all recent, but are built upon a longer trajectory. The £15 million physical transformation of this museum, the new extensions, the new exhibitions, as I say, is accompanied by a conceptual philosophical transformation led by Esme and her team. This, sem this September, just a few weeks ago, Manchester Museum met with a delegation from the Aboriginal Andin, I can never pronounce this, that community of Gut Eitland for the formal return of 174 items of cultural heritage. And it's important to say that this was a return, an unconditional return, not a long-term loan. Objects going back to their community of origin, something that this museum is leading the way in doing. None of this, I realise, is easy. To make this happen, the museum has had to work collaboratively with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. This has been a three-year process to determine where these items should be housed and how, where they could best inspire future generations. These complicated processes of discussion and debate that involve partnerships, travel, that demand deep cultural empathy are enriching for museums as well as for communities of origin. Some of the partnerships that Manchester Museum has forged are not just with communities of origin, but as I said, with diasporic communities here in Manchester. The bleak imperial history that I sketched out earlier is of course difficult to acknowledge. And while the process of confronting that history has to continue, simultaneously museums can look forward to building on new practices and new partnerships aimed at forging more equitable, more honest and more hopeful future roles for their institution. But finally, if I may, in order to fully achieve this transformation, museums not only need to follow in the example of Manchester and reach out to local diasporic communities, the whole museum sector needs to build new relationships that are also inclusive, that help shape who works in museums. Because this sector, like other sectors I work in, television, publishing, newspapers, have got a long way to go as well on diversity and inclusion within themselves. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions, is that right? We, we do have some time for questions. Thank you so much, David. Um, I might actually pour you a glass of water as well. It was a really oh, a wonderful... Done, yeah. um, you, you might leave it. It was uh, wonderful to hear you speak so eloquently. So we have a couple of microphones, and I think Demetrius might have a... Do we have a mic there for Demetrius? This would be... Gwenny, could you bring it here, please, to... Thank you uh, very much for this uh, uh, very powerful uh, speech. I think what I wanted to uh, alert you, I mean, there is nothing that I disagree with in what you've described as a sort of sense, a sort of false sense of ownership that uh, comes out of uh, colonialism. But there are other layers of false ownership. I mean, I, um, I grew up in Athens uh, when I was uh, uh, younger. And uh, I mean, I have very strong feelings about the British Museum, but I also know that the archeological museum in Athens and the artifacts that are displayed there have also uh, created a lot of division, a lot of exclusion. Uh, they have given rise to nationalism, to uh, uh, falsification of history and so on. So you can equally argue that uh, um, a claim to um, the Parthenon marbles by um, 
the Greek government, or Greece, as it, uh, uh, if, if you want to call it that way, is also um, uh, questionable in terms of who owns these uh, items. The more I think about it, the only legitimate ownership claim that I feel comfortable with is that these pieces belong to the space that they were made, yeah. not to a country, not to a nation, not even to their creators even. Uh, I think that the, from my point of view, the most powerful argument I've heard about the, um, the return of the uh, Parthenon marbles is that they will be better viewed under uh, the sun in Athens, as opposed to they belong to the Greek government or to the Greek people even. Thank you very much. I think there's excellent points and lots I agree with. There's a, there's a, a meme online which I'm very fond of, which shows the changing of borders. It's a graphic um, over the centuries. And you can watch the borders of Europe changing and it's like mesmeric. And what it shows us is something which is obviously true, which is that countries, nations, states are constructs that come and go. That the idea of, of the permanence of the nation state is a, a late 19, a early 19th century delusion. The concept of space, I think, is a very is a is a fascinating one that I think people people have written about, really interestingly. And I think what it speaks to is the fact that none of this is easy. I mean, the, the question, the classic example is the Kohinoor diamond, which has existed in India, British India. It's also existed in what's now Pakistan, and it's also um, been recorded in Persia. The ways in which it's moved around the world have always been rather questionable. It's long been a prize of war. There is no kind of obvious place. I mean, returning it to where it came from, we have no idea where it came from. So in some ways, what you speak to is just a background reality. But I think there's, there's two things. There's the problematic reality of where things are best held, most appropriately held. And then there's the, the question of what does it liberate us from doing to escape from the idea of ownership, the finders keepers mentality, that the world ended in the 1970s. And we, when we drew a line under the idea that this sort of uh, uh, looting, this sort of appropriation is acceptable, that there is something for us to gain, as well as from the recipient countries, from freeing ourselves from these mentalities and coming into this and openly entering into this massively complicated world. The kingdom of Benin, now part of Nigeria, is a kingdom that my ancestors were at war with. It's, of course, incredibly complicated. The issue of space, though, I think, is, is, is really important. The Acropolis Museum in Athens, in some ways, it was one of the most powerful spaces, those empty spaces that they've left for the Parthenon and Marbles, I find an unarguable case that, for lots of reasons to do with the pollution of Athens as an asthmatic, which I can very much speak to the reality of, um, they can't be returned to the Parthenon. But the, the idea that they belong, they're more rightfully in London than Athens, in the British Museum than the Acropolis Museum, I just think falls apart intellectually, as well, emotionally as well as intellectually. Um, they are less meaningful in London than they would be in Athens. To any visitor from any part in the world, with no connection to Britain or to Greece, they are disempowered in London, in the British Museum. And I think this level of sophistication, this escaping from the idea of simple binaries, rights and wrongs, and, and asking these deeper, more philosophical questions, I think is part of the debate that is happening. Um, I think the debates about Benin are absolutely fascinating. The, the, should there be a museum in Benin City? Should they be held in the capital, Abuja? Should they be in Lagos, the biggest city? These debates, rather than, I think, being... They've often been framed as debates against movement. I think they're actually part of the process that we should be in our entry, rather than excuses to not get involved, to think, let's remain with the status quo. Thank you. We have another question just here across the aisle. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Njabulo. I'm the curator of living cultures at Manchester Museum, responsible for a collection of more than 35,000 ethnographic anthropological objects from different parts of the world, Africa, Oceania, Americas, and Asia. And all these are not just objects, as you say, they're living cultures, they represent living cultural practices from where they were looted from and all that. We also have got a collection from Benin, nine identified objects from Benin, 
and we are working with diaspora communities to establish the provenance and the repatriation of these cultural materials. My question is just a provocation from a recent pronouncement by President Buhari, outgoing president of Nigeria, about the Benin bronzes. He said museums in uh, the global north are not supposed to return the bronzes to the national museums of Nigeria, but to the Oba, who is the rightful owner of the Benin bronzes. For a long time, the Oba has been excluded in the conversations around where this material is supposed to go. What is your opinion on that? My second question is around what we call shared heritage. There's a group called Restitution Study Group, a group of African black Americans who are arguing that the Benin Kingdom was responsible for selling slaves. And the Manila used to fabricate the bronzes came as a result of exchanging slavery. So they're arguing that Benin bronzes are not supposed to be returned back to Nigeria, but they're supposed to be seen as universal heritage. She's supposed to be shared by everybody. Afro-black Americans of black African heritage are supposed to enjoy these bronzes. What do you think about that argument in view of repatriations? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I, I've, I've met the Oba. Um, um, the kingdoms of Nigeria are part of the federal state of Nigeria. The possession of those royal palaces in some cases have become state buildings, in some cases remain private. Who knows what would have happened to the palace of Benin had it not had it survived the raid. I think it's almost obviously clear that the raid it was burned down accidentally rather than intentionally. Um, I don't think Nigeria is in a position to ask for those objects to be returned to an individual. I think it undermines the universalist case of the idea of shared histories for that to happen. I also, it's hard to know if this was Buhari in his late 80s when he said that. Um, he was never the sharpest um, of observers on these issues, I'm afraid. Um, I'm a follower, a uh, despairing follower of, Niger of Nigerian politics. Um, I've heard this arguments, these, these arguments about uh, slavery and restitution. I just find these to be kind of deliberately vexatious arguments. I think these are arguments that there is a sort of movement within um, some voices within African American history that quite rightly wants to point out the complicity of kingdoms, not just Benin, but also Ijabode, where my ancestors come from in the Atlantic slave trade, to what, in the supply of enslaved people to the Atlantic slave trade. Um, if we're gonna say a society has no right to the objects that it created because it was involved in forms of slavery, then that is most of the societies in the world. I've written and spent much of my life writing about the speci what was specifically different and distinct about the Atlantic slave trade. And I think it does need to be understood as a system that is separate from all previous forms of slavery. But I feel these are destructive rather than constructive arguments. The great advantage, I think one of the reasons why I think the Benny Bonds is, is one of the easiest cases to solve is the sheer number of them. It's never been the case that people in Nigeria have argued that all 5,000 or it might be 10,000 objects should be in a single museum in Benin City or in the living room of the Oba. It's the fact that some of them should be. The fact that the collection in Nigeria is one of the smallest, far smaller than the collections in Britain, in America, in Germany. That is the problem. I wouldn't want to live in a world where I could only see British art in Britain. I don't walk around galleries in the United States lamenting that the paintings of Holbein or the paintings of Turner exist in other countries and have been purchased. I think it's wonderful that these, this creative output, this artistic output is shared around the world. It's the fact that I had access to seeing the art of Benin because I grew up in Britain and my Nigerian siblings didn't growing up in Lagos. That's the problem. And in some ways I think when, when the sheer bulk of that material is taken into account, it's one of the most solvable of all of these restitution problems. And I think it's also one of the clearest cases of not confiscation or seizure, but of theft, theft carried out during the execution of a crime against humanity. The ways in which museums have been complicit alongside historians, my profession, in minimizing the violence of Benin, when people actually go to the records and read what happened in, 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 that, in that military attack, on, a, on mainly on villages and also on a civilian city, they are horrified because it is so discordant with the way it's been presented. I love your Tusker T-shirt, by the way. It's making me have, want to have a, ta a Tanzanian <laughs> beer. Now, I'm going to ask, there's a question from Matthew Cobb at the back of the hall. Very back, thanks, Benin. 
Hello, I, I'm professor of uh, zoology here at the university, and I wondered whether you thought about the other objects that are in museums, yeah. uh, the natural objects, because all of your discussion is about those things that have been stolen in one way or another, uh, that are artifacts, but clearly museums are also repositories of the natural world, which may well have been uh, substantially destroyed in regions, and whether there's a, a place for museums to think not so much about restitution, but about sharing their collections with local institutions to show where biodiversity has been decimated uh, by all the processes we know about, whether those samples should also be sent back or a, a sharing of what we have, some of which will have been yeah. obtained in legitimate ways, others in not so legitimate ways. I, I think the, the, the short answer is yes. Um, I think your question sometimes answers itself. The, in, t in the case of the natural world, these objects, um, these collections, these specimens become an astonishing repository of a world that in many cases no longer exists. And how they are, how they are put to use to the benefit of everybody, particularly communities who've lost that, this biodiversity, seems to me to point to another function, a future role for museums. And in some ways, all of these debates are about how do we take something which is immensely valuable, these astonishing institutions, these amazing collections, and how do we find a role for them that is more equitable, that addresses problems of the, of, the, of the 21st century and the future beyond? How do we evolve them away from their 18th and 19th century functions and devise new, new um, social roles for them? I think the collection of natural specimens is exactly one of those case studies where this material this natural material is of enormous universal benefit, potentially. Uh, and the issue of ownership really, I don't think, should come into it. Um, it's particularly valuable for places just stripped of their biodiversity in ways that are, is absolutely shocking. I was reading a few years ago the accounts of, of Southwest Africa uh, before the arrival of Europeans. And when you read those early accounts of the sheer scale of the diversity of Southern Africa, of the, of the incredible um, size of those herds. You realize that what we show on the David Attenborough films that my friends make in Bristol is a fraction of a lost world. David, thank you very much for um, your presentation. A couple of questions. One is, um, I know a little bit about Asia, not so much about Africa, but there are a lot of billionaires uh, and we talked earlier on about uh, unconditional return. Um, the, the, the feeling is that some people would just buy, buy whatever, whatever has been returned to those countries. How do we guard against that? And the second question really is around technology. Um, we, don't, we didn't have 3D printing. You know, the, do we need the original item? Can't we just print them and send the real one back? <laughs> to take the second question first. It is a really interesting idea whether it's a Western fetish, the idea of the object. I remember the um, first time I went to Japan, I was taken by a Japanese friend to Osaka Castle, and then I looked it up on my phone, and Osaka Castle has been destroyed by firework, by uh, earth, earthquakes, and by war repeatedly. And that's about the eighth, eighth iteration of Osaka Castle. My friend was saying how ancient it is, and I was looking a couple of hundred years old, and he could not see my view that it was a couple of hundred years old because it was this ancient castle. And it was one of those great moments when you realize that you are enormously shaped by your culture, whether you think you are. You think you're being rational, which is a great enlightenment trick that was pulled over our eyes. And actually, you're being, your ideas are shaped by your culture. So I think it's very interesting that, that, that not everybody thinks in that way. And recognizing that is, is, is quite a liberation. In the terms of wealthy people purchasing um, uh, artifacts and uh, cultural objects taken in the age of empire, I mean, one of the things that's happening is that that is a great way of making friends with the Chinese government if you're a wealthy Chinese businessman. This is happening in, this in, in inversion as people are b buying these things for the nation and handing them to museums. If there's an argument, as I believe there is, that Western museums need to share their collections, we need to think about who has access to objects taken from all over the world. It is about access. It's most basic. It's about making them available. To move things from museums thousands of miles away from the ancestors for the people who made them to private collections proximate to the people who made them, but private, out of bounds, achieves very little. And I think that's a, 
a danger, but I think it's also uh, another debate rather than the debate about retribution, uh, return and repatriation. Thank you very much, David. I think we're, uh, I'm going to step here where you can hear me. Um, I think I'm going to ask everybody to join me in thanking David for a wonderful lecture. Uh, really brilliant to hear you in this space, David, so thank you. I'd like to remind you that we have another of our um, solstice events on December the 14th at the John Rylands Research Institute and Library on Deansgate when our colleague, Professor of New Writing, Jeanette Winterson, will be reading and talking from her work, so do look out for that. But I suppose I'd also like to say and to quote um, the poet Derek Mann who talked about there still being places in the world where a thought might grow. And it's really wonderful in the environment that David described so eloquently in his lecture that Esme and the team here have made Manchester Museum one of those places where thoughts can still grow. And for David, um, for doing that for us tonight. So thanks to Esme and the team again, and good night, everybody. Thank you.